All right, hello everybody. It's uh, two o'clock here in Central Standard Time uh, in Illinois, uh, United States. So uh, we'll start get started here. Uh, hope everybody's having a good day and uh, thank you for joining the Grex uh, webinar today. Um, so I'm just going to uh, screen share quick here. So for those of you who are new to uh, Grex, um, we've developed this uh, webinar series um, kind of um, as a reason for COVID-19. Um, a lot of uh, researchers, graduate students in particular, haven't had the chance to um, you know, present their findings at uh, national and international conferences. So this is the reason for this uh, uh, Grex webinar series, um, training series. Um, but in general, uh, Grex members uh, consist of researchers, medical and allied healthcare professionals from around the world uh, who aim to foster collaborative research and innovation across multiple disciplines. Um, so one of our main objectives here at Grex is to develop an effective strategy to increase physical activity and optimize health outcomes uh, in people living with kidney condition. And therefore, we uh, aim to engage more researchers and professionals. Uh, and Grex decided to initiate this Grex trainee webinar to, um, um, you know, initiate some more conversations um, and collaborations through different uh, communities throughout the um, international globe. Um, and then again, today's uh, the purpose of today's uh, Grex webinar um, is for the junior Grex members. Um, students opportunities to present their research on an uh, international stage. Uh, obviously due to COVID-19, like I said earlier, that um, there was canceled for postponed um, uh, conferences, both nationally and internationally. So we've had some very good presentations in the past uh, few months, starting back in uh, May of last year when COVID-19 kind of broke out. And um, we've had some very good presentations. And today we plan to have another series of um, great lectures as well uh, from Susan Rowley, uh, Scott McGuire, and Jin Yao Hong. Um, and um, each presenter will have um, 10 minutes uh, to present their data and um, followed by an additional five minutes of Q&A. So if you have any questions, please hold your questions till after pro the presenter is done. Um, if you'd like to post your um, question to the chat, you can, or if you want to take yourself off of mute as well, you can also ask directly and we can kind of have a, uh, a discussion as well. Um, if your question is not asked um, during that allotted five minutes, we will also have a um, 15 minutes at the very end of all three presentations um, for um, a casual conversation or um, an additional Q&A time. And if you'd like to become a member of the Grex community, um, here's the website for you to do so. Um, and if there's any um, students interested in submitting abstracts for future webinars, um, there is the uh, link to do so as well. And I just wanna do a quick thank you to the other committee members, uh, the organizing committee of the graduate committee. Uh, thank you for helping put this uh, webinar on and the uh, <laughs> So, thank you very much. Um, and our first presenter today is going to be uh, Susan Rowley. Uh, she's a senior hemodialysis nurse at Freeman Hospital in Newcastle um, in the UK with previous experience on renal medical wards and renal transplant units. Following her completion of her master's degree in health psychology in 2017, she is training as a health psychologist under the supervision of Dr. Darren Flynn, a registered practitioner health psychologist and reader in long-term health conditions at Teesside University, Tees Valley, UK. Um, as part of her training as a health psychologist, Susan has undertaken a systematic review to assess the effectiveness of interventions targeting dietary and physical activity, exercise behaviors for weight loss, in adults with chronic kidney disease. Uh, based on her findings in this review, Susan is currently designing a behavioral intervention using diet and physical activity exercise for weight loss in people with non-dialysis CK, 
be attending hospital renal clinics. So thank you very much, Susan, and I will give you the floor to you. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that uh, introduction, Brett. So I, I would like to acknowledge the um, expert input of my co-authors listed here with their affiliations in the course of undertaking the review. We know that obesity is associated with developing chronic kidney disease and with it progressing to the need for dialysis and transplant. In addition, obesity, as in the general population, is not decreasing in people with CKD. Below on dialysis, there may be a survival advantage of a higher body mass index, known as the obesity paradox in the shorter term. It can mask the loss of muscle mass called sarcopenic obesity, which is detrimental longer term. That type of malnutrition is associated with the development or worsening of comorbidities such as type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular and peripheral vascular diseases, especially in the context of inflammation, referred to as the malnutrition inflammation atherosclerosis syndrome. Despite their better outcomes with a transplant than waiting for one on dialysis, people with a BMI of 30 or more have less favorable outcomes than their counterparts with a BMI under 30, both perioperatively and at least up to three years post-transplant. In a meta-analysis of over 200,000 patients, the statistically significantly less optimal outcomes of people with obesity compared to those without were mortality, delayed graft function, acute rejection, marginally worse one, two, and three year graft and patient survival, higher risks of wound infection and wound rupturing along a surgical incision, new onset diabetes, hypertension, incisional hernia, and longer hospital stay. Join hospital the meeting. Furthermore, Canadian guidelines cite evidence that increased risk of death first becomes significant at a BMI of 34 to 36 and is even greater when it exceeds 36. Consequently, people with obesity tend not to be accepted onto the transplant waiting list until they have intentionally lost some weight, usually to a BMI in the range 30 to 35, depending on how their excess weight is distributed. If they are unable to lose enough weight, then bariatric surgery may be considered, but this carries more risks in the context of CKD than in the general population. Robotically assisted surgery is under development to facilitate transplanting candidates with obesity and minimize perioperative complications, but neither of these surgical routes is in widespread use for people with CKD and obesity. Furthermore, uh, commercial and community weight loss programs are unlikely to accept people with CKD stage four or higher, mainly because by those stages, they are likely to need to restrict their dietary intake of foods containing potassium and phosphate. And these programs lack the dietetic input to advise on those restrictions. The hospital renal dietitians only advise people on weight loss once they are actually on dialysis and then only on an ad hoc basis, usually to help them to gain access to the transplant waiting list. There are two relevant Cochrane reviews of interventions in this patient population, one on exercise training, Hewey and Jacobson 2011, and the other on dietary interventions, Palmer et al 2017. Hewey and Jacobson recommended further work on behavioral modification strategies to improve compliance with exercise once supervised sessions were over. Palmer et al excluded studies containing strategies for implementing dietary or lifestyle management. 
neither reported statistically significant reductions in anthropometric measures of body weight or size or improvements in fat distribution or body composition. Our aim then was to identify those behavioural modif modification strategies, which we call active ingredients in interventions to determine which were effective for clinically significant weight loss with people with obesity and CKD. Those active ingredients were the specific, specific behaviour change techniques coded in studies using a valid, reliable taxonomy and other features such as mode of delivery and the training of interventionists. We used the standard PICO format to search for randomised control trials with the listed inclusion criteria. We also excluded studies that were exclusively structured, supervised, hospital-based interventions. These were mostly exercise studies, but there were a small number of very closely supervised dietary interventions. Where possible, we carried out meta-analyses, and we did so separately for the different patient groups, which are non-dialysis CKD, dialysis and transplant. Separate analyses were necessary because of the different consequences of intervening across these study types. Firstly, people with obesity not yet on dialysis may be able to delay or halt progression of CKD by losing weight. Secondly, intentionally, intentionally losing weight for people on dialysis is complicated by the obesity paradox. Thirdly, although people with a kidney transplant may not require restrictions in dietary phosphate and potassium, medica medication essential to the success of a transplant may make weight loss more difficult. To identify active ingredients, we conducted exploratory analyses based on intervention promise, which is an established method in this field. This is the flow chart of the process, which identified the 21 studies in the review. 14 were non-dialysis CKD studies, two were of people on dialysis, and five of those with a kidney transplant. Two meta-analyses were statistically significant. One was of physical activity or exercise only interventions for people with non-dialysis CKD. The other was of combined diet and physical activity or exercise inter interventions for people with a kidney transplant. There was insufficient data to carry out meta-analyses for studies of people on dialysis. There were a, a, a range of behaviour change techniques from nine groupings in the taxonomy that were promising for people with non-dialysis CKD. For people with a transplant, there were only three promising BCTs, goal setting behaviour, self-monitoring of behaviour and instruction on how to perform the behaviour. Goal setting behaviour, which is part of the goals and planning grouping should be done using the acronym SMART, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and timely, such as aiming for a daily walking goal in terms of time, distance or step count. Self-monitoring of behaviour is part of the feedback and monitoring grouping and could be carried out by keeping a diary of all food eaten for several days or a week. The only promising BCT for people on dialysis monitoring of behaviour by others without feedback was also from the feedback and monitoring grouping. Most promising intervention features apply to only to people with non-dialysis CKD and allow tailoring to individual choice. For example, all types of diet were promising which, which suggests that offering a choice would be a good strategy so patients can choose a diet that suits their preferences. 
The promising BCTs and features we identified were from, from interventions that were largely self-managed. That is, they had limited or no face-to-face -face supervision, which raises the possibility of introducing this type of intervention into clinical care due to it being potentially a more cost-effective option. However, our conclusions were less precise using the promise ratio than with standard meta-analytic techniques. Because we identified individual BCTs only, future work would benefit from establishing how they work together and with intervention features. The acceptability of the active ingredients we identified also needs to be tested for people with non-dialysis CKD, those on dialysis and with a trans with a kidney transplant. Finally, the use of underpinning theories or models of behaviour change and treatment fidelity strategies need to be considered in future intervention development for optimum results. Thank you and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, but I, I have a question to you, um, which is an, okay. uh, based on your experience and based on this uh, systematic review that you've uh, just presented. What do you think is the best the uh, behavior change theory that uh, we should base our researches on in, when we are looking at changing behavior, either diet or exercise? In, in your opinion, what's the best behavior change technique, if there is one? Well, um, we didn't come up with any one behaviour te te change technique as being standing out as a promising um, a one to use in intervention development because most of the studies were not theoretically based. Okay. So that's something that we're looking to um, explore in future work. Mm. And when you were looking at the studies, did you have any sort of like theories that kept coming up, such as like a theory of planned behavior, for example, or any other uh, behavior change theories or psychological theories? Yes, um, the theory of planned behavior a little bit, but mostly social cognitive theory was mm -hmm. the, the one that we're going to be using in intervention development. Okay. That's after Albert Bandura, the work of Al Albert Bandura. Okay, we have a question from Brett. Uh, have you come across any specific barriers that, ha uh, that prevent individuals to change their behaviour? No, well, we're going to be doing um, a, a pilot feasibility study, so we hope to find out some of the barriers mm. that way. But um, people with chronic kidney disease have specific um, barriers in terms of their, their muscle weakness and, and their ability to do exercise, which needs to be maintained before the start on dialysis because it becomes much worse then. Okay, uh, thank you. We have another question uh, from Paul and he's asking if, um, uh, sorry, uh, have you seen any early trends in weight changes related to COVID, either an increase or decrease? Uh, with with hemodialysis patients, he um, he doesn't really clarify it, but um... not not really. No, I wouldn't say that's making a difference. I know I know that uh, the the general population has tended to get heavier, mm. but in the patients that I look after, I wouldn't say that's making much of a difference. Okay, thank you. And we have a last question from Alexandra and um, she's asking if, in your opinion, what type of exercise do you think is the best for people undergoing hemodialysis and what uh, cognitive issues do you see most in this group of people? Uh, so that's two questions really. Um, yeah. Well, I think really the, the kind of exercise that they want to do and they, like, they enjoy doing is probably the best exercise for them and not necessarily done while people are on dialysis. And what was the other question? Uh, what cognitive issues do you see most in, in this group of people? Um, I'm not sure what she's getting at there. Um, in terms of their ability to undertake a program of exercise. 
Um, I think it's just any con cognitive barriers that you have identified in your. Uh, I think depression is a big one. Mm. I think low mood is a big one. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we are ready to move on to the next presenter. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Susan. That was great. Um, our next presenter is uh, Scott McGuire. Uh, Scott McGuire is a postdoctoral researcher at Coventry University. His previous research has investigated the acute physiological responses to inner and interdialic exercise in end-stage renal disease. He has also investigated the application of intradialytic exercise on hemodialysis uh, induced cardiac stunning, and his current research is investigating the causes of hypoxia during hemodialysis. Today, Scott will be presenting current, currently unpublished data that compares physiological responses to hemodialysis, both inner and intradialytic exercise. So thank you, Scott. you got the floor. Thanks, Brett. Can you see the screen and everything? Is it all sharing all right? And can you hear yes. me okay? Yes. All right. Okay, brilliant. All right, so hello everyone. So today I'm going to be talking about cardiopulmonary and metabolic physiology during hemodialysis. Uh, this work is or has just been uh, published within the Journal of Applied Physiology, so I would encourage you to have a look at that um, after this potentially. Okay, so uh, just bear with me just whilst I try and press the next slide. Okay. So in terms of the background, uh, I've quoted directly from uh, this article by uh, Matt Green Brown and James Burton, which was a review article that discussed the advantages and disadvantages of both inter and intradialytic exercise. And these are the more kind of commonly discussed benefits of each and disadvantages of each. And I, what you would, I would hope you would notice from this is the fact that a lot of these advantages and disadvantages mainly focus around the adherence and more the logistics, you know, utilizing a free time. Um, or the fact that we're asking patients to, let's say, exercise when they're already overly burdened from uh, the hemodialysis procedures. But what we're lacking here is really any uh, understanding in regards to what is the physiological differences, especially the acute physiological differences between these intra and interdialytic exercise modalities. Now, if the exercise component is controlled sufficiently, the only differing factor that we should see between these two conditions is that of hemodialysis itself. So it's important to uh, compare it look for looking at intra or interdialytic exercise to also compare the normal response to hemodialysis in whatever physiological variable that we look at. And that's what we propose to do here. So comparing these three conditions. Now, in terms of the methods, I'm going to have to rush through them very quickly, unfortunately, but I'll, I'll try and cover everything. Uh, so in terms of gas exchange, we look at ventilatory gas exchange, such as O2, CO2 kinetics, uh, looking at RER, minute ventilation, and we also derived uh, the arterial venous O2 difference from the, the Fick equation uh, for the fact that we had VO2 and we also had cardiac output, and this was obtained via the non-invasive cardiac output monitor, that, which allows us to non-invasively measure stroke volume using kind of four electrode pads that go on the thorax. Uh, in terms of the exercise intervention, uh, this was 30 minutes at a workload of 90% of the anaerobic threshold determined uh, prior to these conditions via CPEX or a cardiopulmonary exercise test. Uh, these conditions were separated by one week uh, so that they didn't influence each other. In terms of the uh, exercise uh, component, uh, uh, intradialic exercise, should I say, and the hemodialysis uh, condition, uh, in terms of the sampling, NICOM was done from the initiation of hemodialysis due to its simplicity of application. However, gas exchange was monitored just before the exercise bout, which was after one hour. The reason for this was purely logistical. Obviously, the patients are getting set up on dialysis and uh, using a cardiopulmonary exercise device. It's a huge device, so it was it was a lot to do with logistics and also patient burden, having to wear a mask for two and a half hours as opposed to the exercise period because we also looked at a one hour post exercise phase as well. So that's just to clarify why we did that. Uh, this is one of our patients doing intradialytic exercise. So uh, this is the car uh, cardiopulmonary exercise uh, device that I mentioned. So this is uh, measuring the gas exchange. Uh, what's poking its head out just at the back there is the Nikon. So this is connected to the patient's forex. 
uh, obtaining the cardiac output. Obviously, we looked at blood pressure, mean arterial pressure as well. Uh, we have got echo here. This was a supplementary study uh, looking at cardiac stunning. I might be able to touch on some of that data if I have time at the end. Uh, but just, just to uh, clarify, this that wasn't part of this, this study. Uh, here are some of the data. So if we focus mainly on the cardiovascular responses to begin with, so we averaged the response over the exercise period. And what we found that was no significant differences between uh, our uh, intradialytic and interdialytic exercise phase. But non surprisingly, these, these parameters do increase when we exercise in comparison to hemodialysis. Now, I'm just going to quickly show you some of the uh, longitudinal data over time here. Uh, so, the white being interdialytic exercise, the blue being intradialytic exercise, and hemodialysis. Now, I must stress this is a very small observational based study and it's a hypothesis generating study. So, therefore, anything here is worth further investigation and just because there isn't a significant finding we must uh, i must stress that you know a larger trial may indeed find something here so we did find trends in the likes of cardiac output to be higher within our intradialytic exercise component and also the potential for this rebound hypotension or this decrease in blood pressure after the bout of exercise which has been reported previously uh, by uh, the groups in leicester now these are really some of the more intriguing findings that we had uh, during our uh, looking at gas exchange, that is. So looking at RER, if you look at the longitudinal data on the right, it is quite clear, but what we're seeing is here is that even resting on hemodialysis, patients breach that anaerobic threshold uh, whilst resting. Now, even when we exercise these patients into dialytic, uh, during the interdialytic phase, they didn't breach that one threshold. So this, this really kind of highlights that these patients are working more anaerobically uh, during dialysis, and it would indicate that there's an increased kind of metabolic stress uh, from the hemodialysis procedure, and hence why we see this differing in RER uh, during the exercise phase. One of the other significant and notable findings here was that minute ventilation appeared blunted in our intradialytic exercise component compared to interdialytic exercise. Bearing in mind these patients are working at the same relative intensity and this is what we're seeing. So the intensity was well controlled based on the cardiopulmonary exercise test like I've said and this is what we're seeing that minute ventilation was indeed blunted. And non-surprisingly, because RER was uh, elevated, uh, VCO2 was also significantly elevated in our intradialytic group compared to our interdialytic group. All of these would suggest uh, working more anaerobically. Now, in, if we just break down the hemodialysis response, what we see is here that VO2, VCO2, arteriovenous O2 difference, uh, decrease and minute ventilation during the uh, hemodialysis condition and they go from a very normal around 5.5 milliliter O2 exchange for the arteriovenous O2 difference to roughly around a 3.5. I think this is the first data to show that but it, it is another marker that patients are acutely becoming hypoxic during dialysis uh, and again I think it moves away from just purely everything being driven by cardiac output here but th that there is a ventilatory component. Now, non-surprising when you exercise patients, it increases during exercise. But one of the areas I wanted to really highlight was that in the post-exercise phase, within that kind of hour mark, um, we find that uh, the exercise component does increase the arteriovenous O2 difference at this point to roughly around a 4.5, close to a normal uh, arteriovenous O2 gas exchange. So it was quite an intriguing response. Again, this was only a trend, and I must stress this would need further and further investigation, but very novel and very interesting data we were getting from this. So I'm going to have to summarize really quick uh, some of the uh, findings that we had here, but RER was elevate, ele elevated throughout treatment, potentially indicating dependence on anaerobic metabolism. Arteriovenous O2 difference decreases with treatment, and gas exchange appears negatively affected by the treatment. Uh, in terms of intradialytic exercise, RER was elevated throughout the treatment with greater CO2 production compared to interdialytic exercise. Uh, ventilation ap appeared impaired compared to that of uh, interdialytic exercise, and intradialytic exercise may potentially uh, improve the arteriovenous O2 gas exchange. 
In terms of the interdialytic exercise, we didn't find any significant cardiovascular differences. However, I think there was trends there, and I think larger studies may, may indeed identify that. And RER was lower uh, during the interdialytic phase than the hemodialysis condition, which I found very, very intriguing. Now, I'm just going to really quickly touch on why this is. I appreciate I'm going to go a little bit over time, but if you bear with me. Uh, so in terms of uh, what this is, so this is the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, or the Bohr effect. And what we have here is that uh, as a patient becomes more acidic, for whatever reason, if that is exercise or if that is end-stage renal disease, what this can do is, is shift that Bohr effect to the right or the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve to the right. And what this would mean is obviously that we increase the delivery. So if we use the example of a partial pressure of O2 of around 40 here, if uh, we are becoming more acidic, then we indeed aid that delivery. So we get a greater delivery of oxygen to that tissue. However, one of the goals of hemodialysis alongside correcting the hypervolemia is also to correct this acidotic state that these patients find themselves in by obviously administering a, a base such as bicarbonate. But there is small studies that, that suggest that this pushes patients too far over the 7.45 threshold into alkalemia. And why is this problematic? Well, if we take the example of 40 in, in partial pressure of O2, this would mean that we actually have a decreased delivery to that tissue. Now, we know that hypoxia is augmented by the hemodialysis procedure, and this is, a, a, I would argue, is a forgotten mechanism uh, because I think a lot of the emphasis is around cardiac output, but alkalosis during dialysis would explain pretty much all of the findings that we have within this study. Now, why would, and also this would lead to a, a blunting in ventilation or that respiratory compensation to that alkalemic state. Now, in terms of why exercise might actually increase that arteriovenous O2 difference is the fact that we may just be simply normalizing pH by increasing CO2 production, increasing acidity acutely, and as a result, normalizing that O2 um, difference and ultimately aiding that delivery to tissue. So a potential mechanism there, and I, would, I don't like to just purely speculate, so we do have some data here which actually nicely demonstrated that O2 saturations did actually improve after uh, intradial exercise compared to just normal hemodialysis. So potentially putting some data towards that, but of course would need a lot more investigation. So to summarize really quickly, I appreciate when way over time, oops, sorry, uh, I've went way over time, I do apologize, but uh, hemodialysis is associated with abnormal cardiopulmonary physiology, uh, evidence now is studied by increased uh, respiratory exchange ratio, uh, blunt admitted ventilation and impaired O2 uptake and extraction. Uh, these perturbations likely also contribute to the altered acute physiological response observed during inter intradialytic exercise uh, compared to interdialytic exercise. Nevertheless, part, and I must stress this, nevertheless, the participants were still able to complete that 30 minutes of intradialytic exercise. So I would stress that this, this study is in no means uh, discrediting the use of intradialytic exercise, but it does potentially suggest that it is more metabolically demanding to perform exercise during dialysis than off. Thank you all for listening. I hope that was intriguing and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, I can't see any questions in the chat yet, but I'm okay. just going to wait for a couple of seconds. Yeah, no problem. I take it as a lot to digest. <laughs> we have uh, we have had two messages, both saying okay. thank you. One from Alice, the other one from uh, Sinead. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Uh, no. no questions. Oh. That's fine. Okay. Um, if you have any other, if anybody comes up with any questions, we're going to have five, 10 minutes at the end. So okay. uh, yeah. just put your questions in the chat. Okay. Uh, no problem. Next presenter. Great. Thank you, Scott.
Our next presenter, last one for the day, um, is Jing Yao Hong uh, from John Hopkins. Uh, she graduated from Johns Hopkins with a master's in health degree um, and is now working on research data analysis um, at Johns Hopkins. And she's currently supervised by Dr. Nadia Chu and Dr. Mara McAdams DeMarco. Uh, her current research focuses on cognitive function, and comorbidities, and kidney disease, and physical and mental functioning in the aging population. So thank you very much. And I will let you go ahead and have the floor. Thank you, Brad. I'm going to begin my presentation. Um, cognitive impairment is a common concern among persons with CKD. Um, its prevalence can be as high as 50%, and it has been demonstrated that for each 10 unit decrease in EGFR, the odds of cognitive impairment would increase by 10 to 12%. We all know that physical activity has many benefits. It is also protective against cognitive decline among the general population. However, the role of physical activity on the association between renal function and cognitive function is understudied, especially among those with CKD. Therefore, our study aims to examine the association of CKD with cognitive function and to explore whether physical activity plays a role in these associations. Our study population comes from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or the ENHANCE study. It is a series of cross-sectional, nationally representative surveys in the U.S. population, which is conducted every year. To generate nationally representative estimates, a sample weight was assigned to each participant and was accounted for in our analysis. In year 2011 to 2014, Cognitive function was measured in participants that who aged 60 years and older. Therefore, we included those participants who had at least one assessment of cognitive function, either objective or subjective, and who had measurement of serum creatinine from which we could calculate EGFR, and we excluded those ineligible for cognitive assessment, leaving a study population of 3,321 per sorry, 23 persons. Our exposures were CKD and physical activity. We used the CKD IP equation to estimate EGFR and used EGFR to categorize CKD into no CKD stage three and CKD stage four and five. Physical activity is collected by self-report based on the global physical activity questionnaire. Um, here is an example of the global PAQ. Participants are asked whether they do a certain type of activity, um, their frequency and times doing that type of activity. To quantify physical activity, we used metabolic equivalent of task or MET. An MET score is assigned for each type of activity collected in the questionnaire and multiplied by the frequency a participant does that activity. We sum the total score into a score for physical activity. Um, the cutoff of high physical activity is 600 MET minutes per week, which is consistent with the US physical activity guideline. Our outcomes are objective and subjective cognitive function. Um, the first test for objective cognitive function is the c -ride word learning and delayed recall module. The CRED word learning test includes three learn recall modules um, in which participants first read 10 words from the computer screen and then try to recall them. After about 10 minutes, there is a delayed recall section in which participants are not provided with the word list again. This test examines um, immediate and delayed memory, and higher score means better performance. The next test is the animal fluency or the AF test, in which participants try to name aloud as many animals as they can in one minute. 
This test examines verbal fluency and higher score means better performance. And the last objective cognitive function test is the digit symbol substitution test or DSST. Here is an example of the DSST. At the top, there is a key matching nine numbers with nine symbols. And here in the empty boxes below the numbers, participants try to match the corresponding symbols with those numbers in two minutes. This test measures attention and processing speed and higher score means better performance. For comparison between those tests, we standardize the test score to a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. We also created a global cognitive score by averaging all four objective tests. Subjective cognitive function is collected by self-report on whether participants feel that their memory has been worse during the last 12 months. And here is the characteristic of our study population. Overall, we have 21.5% of participants who have CKD stage 3, 2.6% of participants who have CKD stage 4 and 5. And overall, there are 49.3% of participants who are physically active. We can see that participants who have CKD are less likely to be physically active compared with those without CKD. Then we measured the association between CKD and objective cognitive function. When comparing CKD stage 4 and 5 versus no CKD, we found that CKD stage 4 and 5 was associated with worse cognitive function in global cognitive function, CRED learning test, animal fluency test, and DSST. Well, when comparing CKD stage 3 versus no CKD, we found that CKD stage 3 was only associated with worse performance in animal fluency tests. Then we tried to assess the association in participants with low physical activity, in participants with high physical activity, and tested whether this association was different between those with low and high physical activity. Um, this is a large table, and let's just take this row for an example. You can see that the difference in global cognitive function when comparing CKD stage 4 and 5 versus no CKD was minus 0.55 units. And the difference in those with high physical activity was 0.10 units. The pupil interaction here is 0 0.01, meaning that there is difference in the association between CKD and global cognitive function between those with low physical activity and high physical activity. Or we can say that this association between CKD and global cognitive function is modified by physical activity. We also found similar results in the association of CKD stage four and five with animal fluency and the association of CKD stage three and CKD stage four and five with DSST. Or we can say that these associations are modified by physical activity. On the other hand, we did not find any association between CKD and subjective cognitive function, either in the overall population or in those with low physical activity or in those with high physical activity. In conclusion, we found that CKD is associated with lower objective cognitive function only among those with low physical activity. Therefore, we recommend that clinicians should consider screening patients with CKD who have low physical activity for cognitive impairment and encourage them to meet the physical activity guideline. Our study has several limitations. Um, for one, we were not able to assess causality due to the cross-sectional design. Also, the assessments in the enhanced did not cover all cognitive domains. In the future research, we are going to reproduce our results in longitudinal cohorts. We are also going to establish trials to test effects of exercise intervention on cognitive function in CKD patients. And 
to investigate the validity of self-reported cognitive function. Well, finally, I would like to thank my colleagues and to enhance staff and participants. And thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a question from Alexandra. Um, so she's asking when designing in your interventions to improve cognitive functions in patients undergoing hemodialysis and doing physical activity at the same time, what type of dual, dual tasks do you think they should be, uh, should be included? Um, do you mean that the population is the those undergoing dialysis? Yes, sorry, do you want me to read it again? Yeah, please. Yeah, okay. Uh, so what type of, so in patients undergoing hemodialysis and doing physical activity at the same time, what type of dual tasks do you think uh, they, uh, you should be including? I think this should mainly be the type of tests that does not interfere with the physical activity. For example, tests um, that merely on a computer screen. Mm. Let me go back to my outcome slide. For example, um, the thread or learning trail is can be done on a screen or using paper cards, while the digit symbol substitution requires a pen and paper so that won't be suitable. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a, I'm not sure if there are, I can't see any other questions, but I have a, a question for you. Could you go back to your last slide? Sure. Thank you. So you, say, you said that your uh, future plans is to look at the effect of exercise intervention on cognitive function. And I was wondering what kind of exercise interventions uh, or inter exercise intervention are you planning to do? Actually, previous study has demonstrated that some types of interventions are effective in those undergoing dialysis, but um, these results are not extended to all participants with CKD. Um, those um, previously um, published interventions include paddling and um, aerobic training, so I think that would be a good start. Okay, so mainly aerobic. Um, I can't really see any other questions, so um, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, my bad. We've just got a question in. Uh, let me check it. So, um, Brett is asking, is there any, are there any type or types of exercises that are better in improving cognitive function? So, for example, this is similar to my questions, for example, aerobic or resistance training. And if you know why that may be. I think the results might be different among the general population and among the persons with CKD. And actually, I might need to do more research about that. So we can maybe communicate after this meeting. Yeah, um, there's also uh, Mara McAdams is asking to email, asking you to email her. So I'm not sure if you can see the chat. No, I'm not asking you to. Um, oh, sorry. Kenya works with me. I was just responding to. Um, sorry, uh, my bad, my bad. Sorry. It, we're all figuring out Zoom, but excellent <laughs> job, Jingyao. Yeah. Okay. If there are no other questions, thank you very much. Yes, thank you everybody to all three presenters. Those were great uh, presentations. Um, now, if anybody would like to stay on and ask uh, additional questions or have just uh, kind of some um, relaxed conversation about the presentations, that's fine. I'm also going to just kind of screen share here. Um, if anybody again wants to um, become a member of Grex, here's the information or if any uh, student um, wants to submit an abstract for future uh, webinars, there is the information provided as well. So I'll leave that up for a few minutes.
Um, I actually have a question. I'm not sure if Scott is still on the call. It's not. Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that uh, you've just published this data on the in the Journal of Applied Physiology. It's, am I right? it's only just been accepted, so it should oh, okay. be within the next. Well, you know, it depends how quick they process, but hopefully within the next month or so, I would say. But it has been, you know, past the final review. So oh, okay. It's, uh, okay. Yeah, okay. so it won't be long before. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I don't if there's no one's got any other questions. Thank you everyone. Not sure if there's Yeah, thanks. Yeah, bye. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye.